Well, howdy, y'all. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah. Today, we're going to recommend that you head right on over to joeshroomshack.com. Dot com. They're having an amazing special on crawfish. What is it? They got crawfish. They got all kinds of crawfish. What kind? You can get the Brazos Dwarf Crawfish. You can even get Jimmy's favorite, the Dwarf Mexican Crawfish. They're orange. There they are. I like orange. Use the Aquarium Guys podcast at checkout for now. 15 whole percent off your entire order of succulent crawfish, shrimp, hard goods. Hell, they got it all. You can take that money and you can buy yourself some spices for those crawfish. Oh, yeah. Also, don't forget about our friends at the Ohio Fish Rescue. They need your love and support. Find them on YouTube, Ohio Fish Rescue. They sure do do a got a good YouTube channel. Those guys are crazy. All right, guys. Let's kick that phone, okay? Let's do it. Hey, guys, just got to give you a reminder that this podcast is actually pre-recorded. So we want to let you know that since the coronavirus outbreak, the Minnesota Aquarium Society's Expo, the Minnesota Aquarium Expo, has been postponed. They wanted to do it, hopefully, towards uh, the end of the summer, but everything is very much related on the coronavirus and how we're all having to deal with it. So please be safe, wash your hands, stay at home, and abide by CDC and local recommendations. Um, we'll keep doing podcasts, especially now since we've got a lot more time on our hands, Jimmy. we got a lot more time, and we're going to be looking for some really cool guests that are going to coming up here shortly and stuff. But uh, first of all, everybody, please be safe. Uh, I know we've been making fun of the coronavirus for some time in here. Forgive Jimmy for doing that. Yeah, we all were. But I, uh, I really want everybody to uh, step back, uh, take a breath, just relax. We're all going to get through this. Let's kick that podcast for real. Welcome to the Aquarium Guys Podcast with your hosts, Jim Colby and Rob Zolson. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast. Today we have another Outside the Tank special. I forget what we actually labeled these podcasts. Out of the box? Out Out of the the box. box. Out of the box. (laughs) And today we have Katie Burgert from Fish Untamed podcast to join us and tell us about fly fishing and why us as aquarists should get into that hobby as well. So, Katie, how you doing? I'm pretty good. How about you guys? Jimmy's looking good. I, I'm looking. I'm always looking good. No coronavirus. He was cleared of it after his cruise. My, after my cruise, I'm cleared of the coronavirus. I'm good to go. I'm ready to go on another cruise. Right. Wait, what? They're on sale right now. Jim. They are. They are on sales. Cheap they've as heck. never been cheaper. No, they've never and, been. And you know what the code is for the sale price? Coronavirus. Corona. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> like, if you try to compare, you know, we had the Las Vegas shooting versus, like, those prices now for uh, cruise ships. Cruise ships beat it out. I yeah, mean, cruise ships are They're the giving cheap. it for free. Yeah, pretty close. Pretty accurate. So, stay away from cruise ships. But, uh, again, I'm your host, Rob Zolson. I'm Jim Colby. And I'm Adam el Welcome again. So, before we dive into this amazing topic of fishing, and specifically fly fishing, we got to do some cleanup. Jimmy? Yes. Do we get all the banners, or do we need more? for the minnesota aquarium expo march 21st i think we're good for i think we're good for right now but i think uh you know the next one we'll do we'll have to have some more banners made this podcast will air just the week before see us in two days when you're listening to this yes that's right 21st of minneapolis minnesota at the augsburg university correct we have the premier booth see when you had dan Rowe on yes i, I want to say mike Rowe every time no it's dan Rowe. right when we had dan Rowe on you gave him crap that we're going to be like positioned by the dumpster so i think he heard that and he gave us like the best booth in the entire in the entire uh, facility yeah we're smack dab in the middle so that should irritate everybody exactly and and we're not near the buffet there is no buffet there is no buffet we have to cater in jimmy john's to make them happy at us my wife says Domino's will deliver anywhere anywhere well, I'm excited now. <laughs> Before pizza. So you had this great idea, and we don't know if it's going to happen yet, but you were thinking about a uh, a wheel of misfortune. Wheel of misfortune. We're thinking thinking maybe that we're going to give away a few things, like maybe a dirty uh, net. Dirty nets, you know, ripped nets with holes. Maybe a dirty sock. I don't it, know. Maybe Jim's <laughs> old, uh, you know, almost half-dead beta. Yeah, it could, could be. I don't you think know, we'll give away. We'll, we'll figure out some good, good prizes, but uh, there'll definitely be some gags in there. But no, come see us at the booth, guys. It'll be a lot of fun. There's going to be a a lot of people there. And it is a local event. There's not a ton of people flying in for this. So don't worry about that coronavirus quite yet. There's only two cases in Minnesota. So uh, wait, there's two now? Yes, there is. As of the 9th when we're airing this. Yes. We'll see uh, where we're at here in a couple weeks. But 
Uh, the other thing too about the uh, about the event, there will be no clowns, and I hate clowns, so I'm really happy about that. I'm bringing a wig and a clown nose now. Oh, great! Just for you. I can't wait. They call Somebody's me horny get the clown. Out by either me or Jim. That's right. <laughs> Somebody's gonna get punched in the throat. I know that. I just can't watch it anymore, thanks to you people. I like it. That's fun. We have uh, a question sent in. Well, it wasn't really a question. I was being notified by Josiah in our Discord. Uh, Josiah is one of our fans. And Discord, if you ever want to join us, it's our fan chat. So you can go to AquariumGuysPodcast.com. At the bottom of the website, there's a link. Join up. It's a fantastic place to intermingle with us fish freaks. I had a conversation with Josiah, and I had to bring this up. Apparently, he has monos, these beautiful, normally very brackish, almost completely saltwater fish. Sea bait monos. Right. Mono sea bait? Okay, yeah. And he's got four plus four to six of them and he's running them acclimated for over two years now to completely fresh but i've always wanted to see a secret because i can only find a handful of people ever to do this and it's not that we're recommending taking monos and putting them to fresh but finding them means that they can be and i want to know the missing element so i asked him to you know test his water and it's like 7.4 7.5 ph nice so maybe that's the trick when you're having monos to try to have a, heart, a higher pH, if you have a higher pH, give them a try. And not intentionally winning them off brackish, but they may do better if uh, that's the case. So I was very amazed by that. And thanks for that information again, Josiah. That's really cool. They're like angels plus for you. I mean. Oh, absolutely. And not the website. They're just better angels. Yeah. I, I think they, they look real uh, similar to a saltwater fish than they do a freshwater fish. And I've had them... With no success whatsoever. You know, they've lasted two weeks, three weeks, and then they kind of petered out. The only way I've ever had them with success is you start them in brackish. And if Robbie ever finds that episode that we did about brackish. It is the lost then, episode at this point. It's in my basement. It's in his basement. That's that's what we're blaming um, on. They do better if you acclimate them to pure salt water almost. One would believe, That's what right? I've always done with them. That's why I was just so shocked. Like, pure fresh water. Like, what is your water quality? I need to know everything. This week... I have a, a small rant to make, and I'm not going to put the gentleman's name in here because it's unfair. Is it me? No. I wish R- it was. Remember when I pranked you and put that glass dildo in your tank? That wasn't very nice. And I felt bad because you guys blame me for a discus dying and your wife wants to uh, have my head, right? Yeah, she wants more than that. She wants part of your bottom part, too. Well, uh, good to know. Good to know. So in a real friendship, not only do you pick on someone, but you also build them up. In the random gifts genre of things, I decided to start looking for not only replacement discus, but maybe a few high-end premium angels if they so uh, arise. I was on a site and found a gentleman that was looking to get out of it. He bred a bunch of angels and sold them for a long time. And he's looking to get out of it. He's moving and realized that it wasn't really worth his while and wanted to ship out his fish to someone that would take them. I said, absolutely, I'll take them. And he had amazing platinum angels he had these blue angels that were like had platinum reflectiveness to them and also pearl scale top end angels like nice full adults pairs the whole deal can i see them i uh, they're in my dumpster right now <laughs> and that's the moral of this conversation is i just want to make a small rant about shipping when this happened we split shipping. He wanted him to go to a good home. I was going to give him to Jimmy. So it's not quite a good home, but you know, good enough. Wow. Thank you. Love you. And when they came in, it, I don't know if instructions weren't listened to or anything else, or he just didn't get it, but he's shipped fish all over for a while now. So I, I, he at least understood. So I told him he had to have foam. He said, Oh no, I got foam. I'm like, it's gotta be nice and thick. You're sending this to Minnesota. No, no I got you. I got foam. Okay, foam it is. Also got to have at least two heat packs, if not more. Yeah, but get in there, have it nice and high. Okay, let's just start with how the the box came in. The box was so big, it was like one third of the space fit all the fish he was sending me. And the list was a bunch of angels, discus, guppies, and the uh, shell-dwelling cichlids, right? That's that's the list of fish. shell-dwelling cichlids. Right, it was skilled. (laughs) <laughs> it was real skilled. So when I got the box in, again, the box was so big, one third of the box fit all the fish. So the fish were loose, thrown in this box, to be jarred around and thrown from FedEx or UPS or whatever the shipping was. Number one, they're getting knocked out and tossed like a salad. 
Number two, the foam was maybe a sixteenth of an inch, eighth of an inch thick. It was like a wall liner. Like it was kind of foam, but it was real, real thin. Real flexible. Right. And didn't really fit tight. There was a lot of that in there. The heat packs were just thrown in there. They weren't taped up to the top. So if anything in there got wet, they immediately kunked out. And that's exactly what happened. You have rubber banded bags tossed in a big box with fish thrown around. There's going to be drips. And immediately all the heat packs turned off. When it gets wet at all, the heat pack shut off. So we have cold fish with no insulation. And then we have them tossed around in an open big box. And then inside the bags, which were triple bagged, I was the least impressed with the bagging, the shell dwelling cichlids, he sent the shells with. And he told me this. I'm like, oh, I'll just send the shells with it. Well, thank you. That's, that'll work. Then I have a place to use these uh, shells with the shell dwelling cichlids. He put the cichlids with the shells <laughs> in the same bag. So he basically made a rock tumbler. He made a rock tumbler, and these things came in pieces. They were literally cut and smashed apart by the time they got to my house. And the shells weren't rinsed. I told him not to rinse them because if he's going to sell them the shells, because he can just put dirty shells in a bag. Oh, that's not a big deal. I can clean them. But when you put dirty things with a fish, what normally would be a normal amount of ammonia spikes in a bag and kill, could kill him in the first hour. Because Lord knows what's in a shell. So I just hope that those fish were killed by ammonia first before they were beaten to pulp. So it was a absolute fiasco out of the entire box. The bag of guppies, four of them lived. And were they endlers? <laughs> no, no such luck. No, no, no. These were black Moscow guppies, so they're nice. real nice. Oh, okay. And a snail lived. So I, I paid half the shipping to get four guppies and a snail. Felt real good. Did you not explain to this guy how to ship? I went in detail. You need a heat pack. You need to put it on there. You need foam. You need thick foam. And he's like, no, I got it. And cut me off. I'm like, all right, you know what? Your experience, you got this. Nope. Well, obviously, he's not that experienced. And then after I get it, it's been like a half a week, and he refuses to message me or talk to me. So it's real weird. Like, if this, if I would have paid for the fish, I would have totally like, oh, this is a scam. But he paid half the shipping. I paid half the shipping, and I didn't pay for the fish. It's just a, one of those deals where you live and you learn, and then you get better foam coolers. Better foam coolers. As soon as you get heat packs wet, they're done. And so with a heat pack, you need to tape it to the top of the box. You need to tape it well. You need to tape it hard. Um, and the thing is, without uh, when a heat pack doesn't get oxygen, it doesn't work, period. So if um, a lot of the people that I get from, they'll actually put a cheap paper plate and fold it in half and put the heat pack inside of that and then run like four or five staples around the edge and then tape it to the top. And that works really, really well. And it wasn't even like it was peak of winter when it came here. You know, it was 40, what was it, 45 degrees when the fish showed up? And how many days did it take to get here? It took, they did overnight shipping. Really? Right. And so the trash. heat packs must have been dead immediately, and it must have sat in a truck overnight. And just so you know, if you go to he and buy heat packs at Lowell's or like a place like Shields, Walmart. Walmart, they're good for six hours, people. You, got, you have to get professional heat packs that last from 24 to 48 hours. 48 hours uh, heat packs are the best, and you usually can get them from any ship supplier. Buy a foam cooler, and if you are going to pack fish into it, always pack tight. Meaning that if you have extra airspace in the box, fill it with garbage. Grab newspaper, grab anything soft that won't affect the heat distribution, and puncture a bag. You know, fill that up tight so those bags stay jarred in the box. What I'd like to do is just, just fill up plastic bags full of air and put it in there, and they act as a, as a nice little cushion. And then when he gets his fish in, he puts them under his shirt and tries to dance like, uh, what was it, the Rockettes? Da, 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 da. What are you talking about, you nut job? I don't even understand. I don't know. Sometimes he, Robbie just goes off in the deep end. <laughs> yeah. People, this is a fine example why some animals eat their young. Right here. Robbie. Are you saying that I'm fat and delicious? <laughs> no, I'm not saying. I'm not saying you're delicious <laughs> at all. Not even a little bit. Damn. But um, also, hard. yeah, and maybe you should probably, you know, when you're running the microwave, close the dang door, because I think the little uh, nuclear particles are getting to your brain. It's happening, man. Holy cow. So I think that's what I got. Anybody else got any news? I got nothing. Nothing? Nothing. See, uh, okay, I don't need to let you guys know that I'm concerned about Jimmy's health. Every time we have the podcast, we do mic checks, and the obvious mic check is what do you have for breakfast? And every time I hear them, it's like gummy bears and vodka. It's just... <laughs> Worse every time. You look good for whatever your diet is. We need to mirror it. Yeah, it's good. Don't worry about me. I'm uh, just concerned. No, I'm good. 
Thanks again for joining the podcast and listening in. If you like what you hear, certainly go on our website, AquariumGuysPodcast.com. Join the fun. There's a Discord link at the bottom, and there's also a way to support us. Number one, support our, our sponsors. They support the podcast to keep this thing going. Or if you want to support us directly, instead of Patreon, we have our own link, which doesn't take the big percentage out. It's right at the bottom of the website. So we, we call our tip jar. You can either donate to us one time or have a monthly subscription to get uh, vast content. And Jimmy's been thinking of ways that we can have a premiere program sending you gifts out every now and again if you're a monthly subscriber. The thing I'm working on right now is I'm having Betty White deliver chocolates to your house. But it's not going so good so far. I got the chocolates. I don't have Betty White. <laughs> I'm I'm sad because <laughs> as a diabetic, I would lose toes for Betty White. Yeah, I'm no, I know you would. All right, well, let's get down to our topic. Katie, I apologize. You've been quiet, and there's a lot going on there for us. Lovely having you on, and can't wait to dive into the topic. How 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 are you uh, for this last you know 15 minutes? <laughs> oh, good. I learned a lot about shipping fish. So I know, right? If I ever need to. <laughs> I'll know what to do. Don't worry. I think on the list, we got to ask you how you ship uh, filleted fish, I think, is the next thing. Well, I haven't shipped filleted fish, but I'm sure I can uh, give it a whirl. <laughs> Excellent. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Now, you have this Fish Untamed podcast. What inspired that? Uh, honestly, it was just the fact that uh, I've got a job where I can listen to podcasts for the entire length of my workday. It, so it's kind of become just an ingrained part of my life to be listening to podcasts. And I listen to enough that I was like, I feel like... I feel like I'm qualified to do one of these myself. So I just won it, I guess, if you will. Just picked a topic I liked and, and started one, see what see what happens. And so far, it's been pretty fun. So what do you do for a living outside of, uh, you know, fly fishing? Uh, I'm a CAD drafter. I need to talk to you after this. I'm actually 3D printing a bunch of aquarium parts. So uh, we'll... Oh, nice. We'll, we'll swap info after the podcast. What but... the heck does she do? <laughs> so She's you have to CAD explain drawing. CAD drafting to Jimmy. I'm, a, I'm an old man. Tell me what you do. What you do. Uh, we just design. Um, so I, my company contracts out to Comcast. So uh, we kind of design where fiber is going to be laid down in cities. And so I'm kind of working on CAD, but as like a mapping service to to map the fiber routes. So the other half I was picking on is they use the same CAD software to design objects, either like right. manufacturing for CAD, so you can make your own filter or whatever part you're looking for. How will mm -hmm. this? How will this help me get free cable? I'm just wondering. Well, I got to figure out how to get it myself first, and then I can pass on the info. All right. That'd be greatly appreciated. Everything in time. So, Katie, hey, how much is the fine if they cut the cable, the fiber optic line? Did you do that this weekend, Adam? No, I just wondered. <laughs> Ooh, I got this one if uh, Katie doesn't know. Well, yeah, like I guess I don't work for Comcast. I just we contract out to, to draw their maps. So I have no input on the actual workings of Comcast. <laughs> So random tangent, it, it, it's variable, of course. I used to work for an internet service provider for about six years, and it's a flat fee to roll a truck, and we're talking in like insurance causes like thousands of dollars, normally like five digits deep. And then every, was it every minute that it's disconnected, there are contractual fines across the board, depending on what it's cut, if it's a main line or if it's just a small city, it can be anywhere from thousands a minute to hundreds a minute. How do we find Delta Airline for keeping me waiting? Schmelta. Schmelta Airline. Delta wouldn't have anything to do with it, Jimmy. <laughs> that, is, that is weird that they could actually get away with that. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, doing that much stuff, that hey, much of a fine. It's, it's amazing. You know, when, uh, when you have hospital 911 services on a, on a line, that matters. It's more important sometimes than electricity. I guess you got a point. Right. Yeah. Anyways, let's get back on the point. That was a good tangent, though. Katie... Um, again, you told us before you're, you're 27 years old. When was your head first dive into specifically fly fishing? Uh, into fly fishing, I was 18. So that was the first time I actually picked up a fly rod. I kind of stumbled into it by accident. So my sister had, was is a teacher out here in Colorado. And I, at the time, lived back in Pennsylvania where I was born. And she worked with a guy at her school who, you know, a lot of the teachers have, you know, summer jobs and things to make some extra money. And she knew a guy who uh, worked at a fly shop uh, over the summer, and he was asking her if he if she knew anyone who enjoyed fishing because they were looking for just some summer help around the shop. So she reached out to me and asked if I was interested. And I grew up just spin fishing, you know, for bass and stuff back home. So I just kind of came out to Colorado on a whim one summer uh, between college semesters to kind of help out around the shop. And that was, I guess, that's his, the rest is history. After that, I just kind of stuck with it and kept coming out. And once I graduated, I just didn't go back home. So is it just tours or tell us details of the, of the shop for people that aren't part of the hobby? Yeah. So, um, 
fly shops are kind of like the backbone of the fly fishing industry, if you will. Um, they, you know, they sell flies and all the equipment you use when you fly fish and, and most of them also guide. So they'll take people out usually on day trips or half day trips and either teach them how to fly fish or if they're experienced, they'll just pay to have someone knowledgeable about the area, take them out. Uh, and since I had no real experience fly fishing when I came out, most of my first year was spent just working behind the counter. You know, I learned what I need to learn and then answer people's questions when they come in, help them choose gear, things like that. Uh, but I'd go along as they called it a junior guide, go along on trips, kind of do the grunt work, help people take knots out of their line and things like that. Uh, and then after a couple of years of doing that, uh, it, you can kind of rise in the ranks and start taking trips out of your own. So uh, after a couple of years, then I would I would be taking trips by myself out um, or leading trips with with other like junior guides who were just starting out where I was. Do you still do guide work today? Uh, not really. I, I'm still connected with them. And occasionally over the summer, I'll take a trip out if they need an extra extra set of hands around there. But it's more of just a they'll call me when they need me kind of thing. I'm, I'm still friends with them all. So uh, we still keep in touch. I don't have as much time as I did back then to to do a lot of extra work. Th- that got you into the hobby. But you said you fished uh, before that? Just standard uh, rod and reel fishing? I, I don't know. What do you call vanilla fishing? <laughs> uh, you call it well in this case it was spin fishing so there's you know there's bait casting and spin fishing and you know ice fishing and all the different types but i was just standard spin fishing which is what i assume most people think of when they think of fishing just a like a lure on the end of a line and a real like an open face reel that you cast out uh, but yeah that's where i got my start i know i mentioned i had a sister but both of my sisters are a lot older than i am so they had actually already moved out of the house when i was growing up so i grew up as an only child Fishing was kind of my way of being able to entertain myself as a kid because I didn't have any brothers or sisters to play with. Um, so that was a way that I could... My, my dad would just send me out with a rod and say, see you later. And it was my job to find something to entertain myself in between then and the evening. When they sent you out, do you guys live on a lake or live close by? I'm assuming some body of water. We lived about 15 minutes from our cottage, which was on a river in Western Pennsylvania. So we, every day during the summer, we'd go out to the cottage and my dad and my uncles would hang out and, you know, do work around the place, chop wood, things like that. Drink beer. And tell us to get out of their hair. They <laughs> drink beer, didn't they? A little bit. Yeah. Well, fantastic. You got in early. Let's go to fundamentals of fly fishing, because again, this whole podcast is to introduce people from the aquarium hobby to encourage them to get out and find the actual specimens out in nature. And what better way than trying a different method of fishing? We've had Hoot the bait guy. (laughs) He uh, did a full-on wholesale bait business and and taught us uh, all details about that. We've had the Minnesota DNR on the podcast. So we have this whole out out of the tank series. And I think it's just important to expose Aquarius to that. If you could explain someone how the logistics of fly fishing works and how is it different from other fishing? I think a lot of people are familiar with what fly fishing looks like. Uh, I assume most people have seen a river runs through it. And a lot of people have probably bought gear after seeing that movie only to not use it again after that. Um, but the, the gist of it is that if you, if you take like a regular, let's say just a regular fishing rod that most people are probably familiar with, you've got your rod, a thin piece of clear line and like a lure or a, like a weighted piece of bait or something on the end. And then when you, bring that rod forward on a cast, the the weight of that lure or the bait um, or whatever you have on the end of that rod is going to pull the line out. And that's that's kind of how you get your cast out there. You can fly fish for any species you can fish for, but a lot of people associate it with trout. Uh, and that's because a lot of what trout eat are very small insects. And so the flies are essentially hooks decorated with feathers and thread and things like that to imitate those small insects. But if you were to put one of those on a like a standard fishing rod, it wouldn't have enough weight to pull the line out when you cast it forward. It would go nowhere. Um, anyone who's tried casting a spin rod with it's, uh, something underweighted will, will kind of know that feeling of casting forward and nothing happens. Um, so instead of using the weight of whatever you're casting out, such as a lure or bait or anything like that, um, in fly fishing, you use the weight of the line. So if you've seen someone uh, casting a fly rod back and forth and they have that thick kind of rubbery line flying around that is a it's called a fly line but it's weighted and so um if you can if you think about throwing a lasso and you're kind of using the weight of the lasso to on the last throw toss it out and and get some momentum 
that's what the fly line is doing. So as you wave it back and forth, the the weight of that line is pulling more and more out until on your final cast, you lay it down and the weight of that line actually pulls the fly out with it. And that's how you get your cast. Really, the whole point of fly fishing is just to be able to cast things that are too small and light to throw on a regular spin rod. I've always uh, lined it up with whips. If you have a long like rope-like whip, there's no weight at the end. It's completely right. held by its own string, except... With a rod, you can just give it more slack. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's a great way to think about it. So at the end of these, the the you didn't call them lures, the actual fly hook at the end. Describe some of those uh, options to us, because I think there's so many variable points, but just at least the introductory. Sure. There's a ton of different flies out there, and some people really nerd out about the flies. I mean, there are people who tie flies who don't even fish. They just really enjoy the, the act of tying, because it's kind of like adult arts and crafts. I guess, just being able to tie them. But there's so many categories out there. But I'd say the three main categories of flies are dry flies, wet flies, and streamers. Um, And I guess technically you could call a streamer a wet fly since it sinks. But for for this purpose, we'll say dries, wets, and streamers. Um, And these things are mostly imitating... Like I said, small insects, but they can they can imitate anything from bait fish to insects to crustaceans, worms, really anything that that is food for fish can be imitated with a fly. The dries, wets, and streamers are so named because dry flies float, so they they'll be imitating things that are on the surface, usually adult insects. If you've ever seen like a mayfly hatch or anything like that, you'll see lots of bugs. Um, flying up, landing back down on the water, and floating down. So that would be a dry fly um, because they stay on the surface. A wet fly is um, just the same thing, but it goes underwater. They usually have some sort of weight on them, like a bead at the front to weigh them down, so they sink. They don't all have that. That's one common type of uh, nymph. Uh, A nymph is another word for the wet fly. Gotcha. And when you say sink, it doesn't go down a a long ways, does it? Not usually. I mean, they have heavier ones that are designed to to get down very quickly. Uh, but it's not like if you were to throw uh, like a lure that had a, a big like a lead weight on it, that's just going to like drop straight to the bottom. That's not the goal is to is it's not to drop it straight to the bottom. Gotcha. Uh, and then the last type is the streamers, which is probably the closest to um, like what people would associate with a regular lure. Like if you had a little lure that looked like a fish, the streamers are usually imitating things like that. So leeches or small bait fish or things like that. Those are usually much larger. Uh, They sink a little bit faster. uh, And you might be actively pulling those through the water the same way you'd reel in a lure. I see some of those like compared to like a common Rapala, except they have feathers and a lot lighter. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a good comparison. Um, And you fish them kind of the same way, too. Whereas many of these flies, you'll cast out and kind of let them drift with the current, trying to imitate it like an insect that's drowned and is is not moving anymore. Um, most of the streamers you're casting out and you're bringing them back in toward you to imitate like a moving fish. So just the same way you'd cast out a lure and reel it back in. I think one of the most interesting things on this is, like you said, the imitation of a bug. I've seen some of these flies being purchased to imitate for archer fish, Jimmy, one of Jimmy's favorite fish. And okay. what they'll do for archer fish is, again, there's like a three banded fish in the water. They'll have the water level in the tank like 50%. So they have a lot of open space above in the tank. And you, mm-hmm. you put crickets on branches and whatnot, and the archer fish will shoot a stream of water dead on accurate every time to hit the bug to drop in the water so they eat the bug. So they Yeah, use, I think I've seen documentaries about that. <laughs> oh, they're beautiful, entertaining fish. And what they do is they take these flies that you purchase from a fly store, and they'll just dangle them around the tank. So they're shooting these flies all the time so you can interact oh, with your fish interesting. more. So it's if it's effective even for the archer fish, you know that this is definitely imitating the bug on the water surface perfectly. Yeah, I wonder if they've uh, tested, you know, at what point does it not look real enough that the fish doesn't care about it anymore? Or how many times does he spit at it and it doesn't come down and he just goes, I'm going over to uh, right. McDonald's. <laughs> well, you got to think of it like a cat toy, right? You're dangling the toy in front of the cat. If you just leave it there, the cat's going to ignore it. But if you like bring it in kind of like as a play toy uh, every now and again, they'll still hit it. So some of the creations on these... Like you go to a bait shop that I'm normally used to. I, I give the example of like a Rapala. That's a brand of uh, lure that you use for a lot of trolling or hard reeling where it goes a lot deeper. You're seeing all these pre-made lures. Well, you know, fly fishing is, it seems to me like it's older and people hand make these all the time. You get kits to make flies. It seems to be a lot different. Do you make a lot of your own flies? Uh, I would say I make a lot. I make a handful of select patterns that I've decided are worth my time. 
Uh, I think that someday when I have a little bit more time to myself, I probably will. But for the time being, uh, I think it's just it saves my time and hassle to just go buy them for the most part. I'll, I'll do a couple patterns that are pretty easy and quick. So what are some of the materials you use in fly creation? Uh, I mean, I'm definitely not the expert on this, so I'll probably sound pretty dumb if I start trying to list beginner level. (laughs) Beginner level. I mean, I can tell you the main like the main categories of things you're using. You're using different threads. You're using lots of different wires of different weights. So some wires are very thin and they're just kind of there to put ribs on the on the body of the insect to give it kind of a segmented look. And then you have other wire that might be a heavily weighted or very thick wire that's used mostly to wrap around the hook to give it some weight. Um, you're using beads, feathers, fur, all kinds of different parts of all these fur. animals too. So that's where I start to that's where it starts to lose me is I don't know a lot of the very like specific types of feathers and furs that they pull off. But th- those are like the main categories. And there's also synthetics. So people will use um, little rubber pieces of rubber to make little insect legs and synthetic like they call it dubbing um, which is just kind of like a a synthetic type of fur or fuzz so it's just a lot of things like that that basically if you can tie it on a hook with thread it could be used to make a fly so a lot of the ones that i've seen and again i'm going this off of like one or two times that i've ever attempted fly fishing and my fly fishing story is taking off like half a dead tree next to me and when i say half a dead tree like timber giant wave almost got killed (laughs) <laughs> so that was my uh, sad experience. But I saw a lot of these flies with corks. Is that still uh, relevant and being used? With cork? Yeah, like cork. Like, like, floating, a, like, like a popper? A, like a wine cork. There are some like popper flies, like especially bass flies. They're made with, like, I don't know if it's actually cork, but um, some sort of like buoyant light material. I, I assume it could be used with, with cork, uh, but basically to recreate a popper. And, and those ones are almost on the verge of not really being flies. That's kind of a contentious issue. I don't, I don't really care. I don't differentiate. And I think it, most people who really put a lot of thought into whether something counts as a fly um, are being a little too uppity for their own good. But I mean, my thought is if it's light enough to cast on a fly rod, it can be considered a fly. Uh, but a lot of those poppers, it's like if you, if you were to think of just like a plastic popper that you might use with a spin rod, there are ones that are basically identical, but are just made of a lighter material, which is usually something, like you said, like kind of like cork. They've just carved to look... Um, like a frog or something like that with a little popper mouth. And for the listeners that, again, have never fished, these popper lures that we're talking about are to imitate something that's injured on top of the surface. So I do a lot of the uh, bait casting, the uh, spin casting uh, that you were just describing, fishing. And I've always just, it's just been fishing where I'm at right. across the board. It's fishing, ice fishing, or spearing. That's how it is in Minnesota. I've done a, a bunch of popper fishing. And the idea is you take... One of the most common, the oldest lure that I saw there is called a hula popper, and it's to imitate an injured frog. So it doesn't look like a frog from uh, from how you're looking at it, but from the fish below, it's got a white belly. It makes a bloop as it uh, springs through the water, and you literally cast it out. It stays in the top, and you just jerk it slightly every now and again to mimic the frog trying to jump in the water. Fish hear that, and bass, especially largemouth bass, will leap two, three feet out of the water trying to hit these things. It's one of the most enjoyable things. So having a nice lighter version to hit fish on fly, I'm assuming is just just as fun, if not more fun. Yeah. And honestly, I think some of those poppers that are designed as flies would probably be heavy enough to be cast on certain spin rods as well. Like I said, there's there's kind of a gray area um, where it's it's it can be questionable whether something actually counts as a fly versus more of a lure. Um, I think the difference is like I've used those hula poppers too, and they're made of plastic and usually have some rubber off the back. And usually the flies I see are made of some sort of um, like, like cork or balsa and have feathers off the back, but it's like, it's essentially the same thing. Um, And honestly, if you've got a big enough one, I bet you can cast it on a spin rod as well. So Katie, where have you all fished in your fishing career? I know I I see a lot of uh, guests on your podcast that have fished uh, certainly everywhere, but what is, what is your, uh, your range that you've been on fishing trips? Uh, let's see. Well, I mostly, like I said, grew up in Pennsylvania and until I left for college. That was pretty much the only place I did fish. I think, um, I never really got sick of my home water and I still go back to fish it every year. Uh, but out here all over Colorado, I don't really just like distinguish between lakes or rivers. Like I'll fish, you know, in town five minutes from home in like a bluegill pond, or I'll go up in the mountains and, and hike in for a couple days. You see I've water, been, you get chills, you have to fish it. Yeah, essentially, unless I see trash floating by, that kind of turns me off. But <laughs> if it if it looks nice and and there's a good view behind it, then I'll I'll fish it. But I've hit Wyoming, 
Uh, I've done Montana, California, let's see, New Mexico. If I can get to it in a car, I've probably done it in a weekend. But there, there's just so much to see around here too that I, as much as I want to get out and about, they, like I never get sick of of what I'm fishing here. What are the, some of the species that you commonly try to go after, and what are the, some of the other species that you catch up by accident? It's weird because where I grew up was a river that was kind of, um, it had everything in it. Like you could go out and the majority of it was smallmouth bass fishing. And if anyone's fished for them before, uh, they might understand why that's my, I would say that's probably my favorite fish. They're just so fun. They're, they're super strong, super aggressive. But in that river, it was kind of a toss up. Like you'd, you'd mostly catch bass, but I've probably caught, I don't know, maybe eight to 10 different species out of that river while targeting bass. There's just a lot of bycatch of walleye, largemouth bass, pike. Uh, I caught a muskie out of there once fishing for bass just by accident. That's kind of a different situation than what I have out here, which is, you know, in the mountains and these small streams, it's pretty much exclusively trout. And there's lots of different species of trout, but you don't usually go out and get surprised by something completely random really the only thing I catch out here that might be considered accidental is a mountain whitefish, but I actually prefer mountain whitefish to trout fishing. I think they fight a little better. So it's, it's always like a pleasant surprise if I, if I hook one of those instead of a trout. So now are, do you eat the fish or are you just a complete game fisher? I wouldn't say half and half, but I do keep fish occasionally. It depends where I'm fishing. If I'm close to home, like we're, like I said, we're down in the Denver area. I don't really keep anything from you know, anywhere within 30 minutes of where I live, just because there's, it's so developed. Um, and I'm not really sure about the water quality, but up in the mountains, I'll keep fish occasionally, especially if we're camping and have a fire, you know, something to cook the trout over. Then, uh, we'll, we'll keep a handful. We go out and, you know, just the ones that are medium sized. What's the different intricacies of fishing on a lake or pond versus like a river? I'm assuming the river is the one that you go to, because again, fly fishing in my mind is synonymous with trout and trout are on rivers, but that being said, if we have a you know beginner, I'm assuming uh, lakes are going to be easier. Is that correct? I would say yes. So there's a whole bunch of different things to take into account with that. Um, so first of all, trout also do live in lakes. So a lot of people associate fly fishing with rivers. And I think I blame that a lot on on things like a river runs through it where people have seen it. And that's that's the image they have in their mind. Um, and so a lot of people, the first time they go out, really want that experience. They want to be Brad Pitt doing the giant cast in the middle of a river. Uh, but you're right that it is, I think, much easier to start on a lake because while there are different techniques for both, it's essentially the same thing, except with a lake, you're not worrying about the moving water and trying to figure out where a fish is going to be in that moving water and how to deal with it. I think for first timers, well, A, the yard is probably the best place to learn to cast because you're not worrying about the fish. You're just focusing on your cast. But let's say you do want to start on the water or you have tried a couple times in your yard and you're ready to go actually fishing. I think a lake is the best place to go. And I think going to like a bluegill pond is probably your best bet because you can fly fish for bluegill and they eat anything. I'm sure you've, you've had that experience before. So my experience is, is oh, especially with bluegill, I grew up really poor, like eating out of cool bowls, food shelf, cereal, poor. And growing up, there's some times where I, I never felt like I grew up poor. I felt like I grew up wonderful. I grew up on a lake. Who, who what privileged kid wouldn't want that? But there's summers where my mom's like, go catch fish and then go get field corn from next door that will boil with sugar water. And that'll be our meals for the next two days. So I go out, I make myself a pop can fishing rod. I don't know if you've anyone of you has, uh, you have ever seen one of these. This is just getting sadder as, as, is it? as we go. Yeah. <laughs> you got that violin for me? Like, no, I'm, I'm going to get a tissue here. We should. All right. The tissue. So how do you make a pop can fishing rod if you're uh, in the in Rob's redneck ghetto is you take your can. You take that pull tab, you know how you open up a normal pop can, and you just put it out directly, straight up from the can. You tie your fishing line onto that little pull tab, and then you begin to wrap the line around the center of the can. That is acting as your reel. So you fill it up a good, I mean, you don't have to have a ton of line on there, but at least enough feet for, I'd say, three times what you would cast normally on a pole. Then you put your hook and bobber onto it, you take your can while holding the can and just toss it and it works well because it just releases off the slidey can the line just pops right off and it's it works a beautiful cast so that's how it would catch fish is a just a common you know cheap hook bobber fishing line on a pop can and i would use corn from the field next door the field corn and just pop off a kernel and put it on the hook i would catch the biggest 
you know, most active bluegills on just corn or bread pieces or whatever I had around. But corn was like the most active because we're right next to like a farmer's field and I could steal cobs as much as I wanted. That is the saddest story I've ever heard. <laughs> it was some of the funnest growing up. <laughs> Right. Holy cow! I, I I just picture Rob out there, you know, with a paper clip and a shoelace, you know, and a and a stick. No, no, no. You use <laughs> shoelaces were too too valuable to get rid of. You use shoelaces to, uh, you know, let me loop make up your fish together when you catch them. It's, it's your stringer. Let, let me make a point here. Rob doesn't even use shoelaces. Everything he has is Velcro. He don't, hey. even know, he don't even know how to run shoelaces. If they had light up shoes for adults, you know, when you walk and they they light up. I would wear them, but they don't have them for my size. Did you not come over to my house about two years ago with light-up shoes? No, no. Those were like LED. They had a battery in the back, oh, so and they- I would turn them on. They wouldn't like stomp and light up like the cool kid oh, shoes. Yeah. Also, don't get those shoes because they put the battery in the heel, and it's, uh, it, it's a lithium battery, and mine started on fire. So don't get those shoes. <laughs> Public service announcement. They're way worse than one of those little, like, two-wheeled scooter things. We should put some really sad music right here, you know, from, like, Old Yeller or something, you know, of, of Rob's port. All right, you heard that, producer. <laughs> put it right here. <laughs> the music. The sad, sad music. Sad, sad music. Lord. But no, yeah, if you, if you want to try fishing out for the first time and you say you don't have money, I'm calling BS. Get your favorite beer can and give it a try. So, you know, speaking of money... What exactly, what is a kind of a starter fly fisher rod going to cost? You hear that, Katie? We just got Jimmy into it. He's he's looking to invest. He's thinking about it. I mean, obviously, you can spend as much money as you want, but I feel like if you want to get kind of the essentials that you need to go out. So if you, if you want to go into the store and come out and walk straight over to the pond and start fishing, you can be in and out for around 150 bucks um, with everything you need. That's not including things like waders and stuff, which is necessary if you're fishing really cold water. But a lot of people just put them on because that's what they're supposed to do. It looks um, cool. Right. But I mean, I'm not going to wear whistle, waders whistle. on an 80 degree summer day. <laughs> so the 150 bucks for that will get you a, a pole. A lot of fly rod companies sell. Uh, they usually call them either combos or outfits. But instead of having to buy like you can't, you can buy the rod and the reel and everything and put it all together. Um, but a lot of companies to to kind of cater to that beginner crowd who doesn't really know what they want yet, they'll sell these outfits, which is essentially a rod a rod case that comes with a rod reel line all strung up together and in this rod case. So you you come out with the the whole package set up, you pull it out, and you can literally tie a fly on and start fishing right away. And what's the price of? I mean, I've seen some of these flies go. For a lot of money, just the flies or the fly rods? No, I'm no, talking about the, the flies. flies. How much? What's the most money you've ever spent on a fly? The most I've probably spent is like maybe ten bucks. I'd say they average around two to three dollars, depending on the fly. But it it does depend on the fly. The more simple ones might be like a dollar ninety nine. Some of the I'd say the average is probably like two fifty. And then some of the more complicated ones like bass bass flies or saltwater flies or pike flies. Those ones are the ones you'll start to spend like double digits on. So what's okay. the most expensive fly you've ever seen? Now I need to know. Ever seen? I don't know. Probably not more than $12 or so, but I'm not usually like, I'm not even looking at those when I go into the shop. So I probably just tune those out when I'm in there. Uh, I'm sure there's more expensive ones in there, but I'm not, I'm not usually buying those ones. So say Katie, have you ever read the book? Um, the feather thief? I have. Yes. Isn't that a good book? I really enjoyed that. And you know, it wasn't even really about fishing at all and it was mostly about the feather trade but i did really enjoy it yeah it was just i was surprised and it, and i didn't realize that people were that crazy but then i realized that they're british you need to share with the class <laughs> i was what gonna say book about we're talking crazy okay. i need to know crazy okay so the feather thief is a book about a guy who broke into the trend museum i think or trend museum and stole a bunch of skins from birds of paradise from like 150 200 years ago like type specimen birds and in britain they like to collect things like eggs um orchids butterflies it's part of their colonial thing but anyways i'm probably not allowed in britain now but no anyways, you're, you're 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 banished i might be from another but anyways country. um this guy stole all these skins and he stole like what was it like a million dollars worth or a couple million dollars worth of skins i think we should yeah, have also a put a spoiler alert to the beginning of this, by the way. Well, no, they talk about it in the th- in the book. That's and the idea. You're nope. spoiling the book. No, no, no. They talk about it like on the cover of the book. Oh, this good. is like the whole. This is like the whole. It's it's a true story, and it's yeah. it's like the story of this heist. And it's so, like the main. So this actually happened. 
Yes. Yeah. I thought you two were just smoking crack. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Now no, I'm going Britain, to pay attention. In Britain, they actually like, there's certain flies, the fly tires. They don't even fish. They just tie flies. Am I right? Yeah. So that's actually probably a good thing to mention real quick before we finish this story is that what you're asking about the most expensive fly that like I've seen, um, this is like actual practical flies in a fly shop that you're going to buy and use for fish. There's a completely separate world for, uh, they're, they're these fancy salmon flies that it's an art form where they get all these rare feathers from birds all over the world. And there's like recipes for these flies where you have to get, you know, one feather from this bird and one feather from this bird. And they tie these flies that are like actual works of art that are never meant to be fished. And those ones, you know, the ingredients in those would cost several thousand dollars. I think you're talking, yeah. you're talking witchcraft now. Well, that would no, make no, sense no. why that, we're seeing completely so different world. Yeah. I have yeah. a new t- <laughs> tongue of tongue of something. I don't know. Yeah, but it was just really cool to read it because like one of these feathers would sell for like a hundred dollars a piece. And then in order to do the recipes, you had to use certain parts or certain feathers from the bird. So like you had to go from either the near the throat or the wing or the tail. And you had to use like one feather of this, one feather of that, one feather of this. And like the guy just sold the feathers off on eBay. And I don't want to go, spoil it, but if you guys want to read a really interesting book, it was really interesting because I didn't realize that they were they're they're right. That guy's like right up there with like egg collectors. So is this like a black market of, of sorts or not? Yeah. Yes. OK. Yeah, because everything sighties, all these birds are like birds of paradise from like Papua New Guinea and New Zealand and Australia and stuff. And they're all black. They're all it's all black market stuff. And Adam, like, you can. Huh? I was going to say, can you also tell what uh, CITES is for some of our listeners? We've mentioned it oh. quite a few times in the show, though. CITES is, it's basically a, they dis, they're in charge of the trade of rare and endangered animals. It's a scientific community, and they're really, it's a good thing for people to do and look at, because then you can see what's available. They just put toke geckos on CITES, which I don't know what the hell they did that for. But it also controls, like, the trade, so they'll basically say... And every country has their own CITES permit where they're allowed. They say what we, what you can and cannot catch. So like Brazil, when they put, remember when uh, zebra plecos went on the blacklist, Jim? Yes. Yeah, that was CITES. Brazil just told CITES, we're not shipping anymore. We're done. So they go on the CITES list where that you can't get them anymore. And CITES will actually have permits. So like, say Brazil wanted to release like 100 zebra plecos. That's all that they allow in the trade. So if any more than 100 come out, they know that those are illegal and they track the crap out of stuff. But they all like they they are in charge of like all plants and all wildlife. So they're in control of like elephant tusks, um, rhino horns. They they basically go for every rare and endangered animal in that country, fish, bird, everything. And they can they say what you can and cannot have. And if you find it, it's illegal. So they regulate it. Yeah, they're they're like international regulators and they kind of have like international jurisdiction. Everybody wants to kind of get on their good side for stuff. So in this book, when this happened, what what year are we talking about? Was it something eighteen hundred? This is recent. Yeah, it was really recent. It was like early two thousands, I think. Wow. It's yeah, just that sounds a really right. good book to to read. You can get it from your local library if you can or buy it. But it's a really interesting book because it like talks about the feather trade and they didn't even think it was that big of a deal. There was the the place where these skins were kept didn't even have, uh, you know, anti theft devices. The guy literally just busted a window, walked in and walked out. Sounds like the big the big uh, heist in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, when they stole Dorothy's slippers from the Wizard of Oz. Didn't that Pretty get much. found? It did in Minnesota. Yeah. Down in Minneapolis. Yep. <laughs> For those who are listening, Adam is from Grand Rapids, Minnesota, which is a home birthplace of uh, Judy Garland. And they had brought in the ruby red slippers, one of, I think there's seven pairs of ruby red slippers from the Wizard of Oz, and they put it on display in this small museum in Grand Rapids. And in the middle of the night, somebody had knocked out a window, walked in and grabbed these priceless ruby red slippers and disappeared. And it took, what, eight, nine years before that it was found. You mean before yeah. you dropped it off at the uh, airport? Yeah, when I was when I was done wearing them late at night, <laughs> up and down the runway. There's no place like home. And, uh, yeah. There's no place like home. No, I was wearing them, and I I kept going uh, up and down my hallway. My and I was going that I'm too sexy for these shoes. Too sexy. I thought it was more like I'm a pretty girl, but okay. Yep, definitely. We went off on a big tangent. <laughs> Another there. one, man. <laughs> well, at least but now no, now it's a uh, you know fascinating to know why I was watching a documentary about these birds. 
uh, that were extinct across North America and other countries. And they kept all these in a just super secured museum outfit that, and I just couldn't understand why. I'm like, it's just a bunch of dead birds. I, I realize I need to be, you know, locked up, but that, that much security, well, if they're going for like a couple thousand a feather, uh, I understand why now. Yeah. And a lot of these, I mean, these, when these fly patterns were designed, like not these birds weren't all illegal. Um, and that's kind of what the problem is, is that these, books and forums and things where people are talking about these classic patterns. It's like the patterns were developed when all these feathers were available and then they disappeared. You know, they, they people weren't allowed to buy them anymore no, instead of changing the patterns. I mean, some people have changed their patterns and found replacements. You know, it doesn't have to be this particular bird. They'll, they'll just replace it with something that looks the same, but there's those people who don't feel like it's correct unless they've got the right pattern and that's why these feathers are still in really high demand because people don't want to, to to find like an alternative to make these fly patterns they want to follow the original recipe if i want to start making making some flies I mean, where does one buy feathers i mean the feathers are us or what they sell them at the local fly shop they so do. fly shops will sell the gear the flies and the fly tying materials but it's only good if you slaughter your own chickens right jimmy no we're not slaughtering chickens <laughs> And the stuff you'll find there are like normal feathers. They're not endangered birds in foreign countries. You, you'll find things like roosters and pheasants and things like that. You know, up here in northern Minnesota, we we have a bunch. And when I mean a bunch, we have bald eagles everywhere. And it is illegal if you would pick up a bald eagle feather from the ground. It is illegal in minnesota i don't know maybe it's nationally it's too federal i think that might be national Fed- yeah. yeah it's federal yeah, it's, a federal. It's, it's a federal law you can't even you can't even pick up one off the ground and i know um in our local zoo down in Wapton, north dakota when i belonged to zoo association down there that it was quite the thing that when eagles would molt and there'd be feathers down there and people would try to come and grab them and the zoo association was always quite adamant about trying to grab them and, and putting them in storage and I don't know what ever happened to them, but they wanted to make sure that nobody was breaking the law. The only way you can have an eagle in a zoo is if it's hurt or got a bad wing or something and can't be put released back out into the wild. So it's kind of interesting. A lot of these feathers have, have got some um, major federal laws behind them. Well, see, eagle feathers are protected by the Migratory Bird Act or the Birds of Prey Act. Hawks, and if you want to be a falconer, you have to get like all these federal licenses. And the only way you can have eagle feathers, like bald eagle feathers or any of them, is if you're native and you have a special piece of paper. So, like, you can have them, but you have to be Native American and you have to go through some stuff. And you have to literally carry that piece of paper with you everywhere when you have that feather. But, yeah, they're, they're like, federally protected. And that's uh, that's right up there where you want swat on your ass. That'll get you, <laughs> that'll get you swat on your ass if you walk around with a bald eagle feather and you don't yeah. have paperwork. This is what you get for hanging out with a bunch of fish nerds. We know a lot of like useless information, zoological (laughs) bogus info for the listeners. You know, you can make your flies, purchase flies. Um, We've talked about, you know, casting, go to a bluegill pond or lake uh, to try to do it. The first, make sure you're out of the way of trees. Otherwise you'll have, you know, like one third of a tree falling on you. Like uh, did me practice at home. What's some other recommendations you have for beginners getting started? Yeah, so my my top two, like you want to start on your own tips, and this is assuming that you don't have someone to show you how, because there's you know there's obviously no substitute for if you have a friend who knows how to do it, having someone show you in person. Um, the other way to do that is to hire a guide, but that is you know a little limiting in price if if people don't want to spend a couple hundred bucks on a guide for a day. Um, so assuming that you just have the gear you need and you just want to learn to do it on your own, the first two steps I would take. First is look up terminology for fly fishing. Because if you open up like a video or read an article or something like that, uh, it's not necessarily the same set of terms that you would see if you've been, even if you've been fishing uh, before, like if you've been spin fishing for years, you could like watch someone cast a fly rod in a video and I have no idea what they're talking about when they refer to the different parts of the line, um, different parts of the rod and reel, things like that, and the different techniques in the cast. So the first thing I do is look up um, just some basic fly fishing terminology. That way, when someone references the backing or the fly line or the leader, you know what they're talking about and you're not trying to pause the video quickly and and figure that out. Uh, And then once you have kind of that basic terminology, which, you know, it's not long, you'll probably be able to learn it in 10 minutes. But once you have that down, 
I would just go to YouTube or um, Orvis, which is a, one of the major fly fishing companies, has a, an entire video series on their website. You could just watch those videos and they'll walk you through every step of the cast. And you can stand there in the yard with your YouTube out and just mimic what they're doing. And once you've done that a couple of times, it's, it's really just getting out on the water. And like I said, if you go to a bluegill pond, those fish are pretty forgiving. Uh, it's, it's not rocket science to, to get them to eat something. And so even if your cast is terrible, the, the main thing is, as long as you're catching fish, you're going to be motivated to, to try it again. And, you know, you just got to kind of do it a couple of times before it's going to start to come a little bit more easily. So trying to jump straight into something like trout, where you may go out two or three times in a row and not even get a bite, that's going to be kind of discouraging. So that's why starting with something easy like bluegill, where you might catch fish, even if you're absolutely terrible, you're going to come away thinking like, wow, I did such a great job. I'm a hero. And you know, then you'll go a couple more times. And by that point, you'll start to kind of get the feel of it. It's going to feel a little bit awkward at first. But once you once you do it a couple times, it'll start to flow a little bit better. Uh, the mechanics will become a little smoother, a little easier. Uh, and at that point, you can start looking up more specific questions that you want to know um, or go into a fly shop and ask people there. Um, you know, you can always go into a fly shop and ask for help, but it's a little bit helpful um, on your end if you kind of know what to ask when you go in. Because if you go in your first time, you might you might be standing there just wide eyed, staring at everything on the wall and have no idea what to even ask. So I think going out once or twice before you go to a fly shop, um, just so you have a couple questions in your pocket, is probably the best way to go. Clearly, you've helped a couple people start fly fishing. So yes, <laughs> I always try to like explain it as getting on a bike you know learning how to bicycle takes maybe a, a few days of solid uh, trying before you get off your training wheels and dad helps you how long does it take for the average person that doesn't have you know rheumatoid arthritis to uh learn a decent acceptable cast i'd say a decent cast um that can catch you a fish that's that's the requirement here are you going by uh, like number of hours you're out or uh, like, or just like how many full days you're going. Cause I, I feel like there's some people who have it down by the end of day one, but usually those people are out for a full day no, in an hour is probably not going to do it for you. So I'd say maybe between eight and 16 hours. So let's say like two full eight hour days by the end of day two, you should be getting pretty comfortable with it. By that point, you're definitely not going to be an expert. You're still going to be making mistakes, but by that point you should be able to kind of explain what you're doing, um, feel when you're doing something wrong. And be able to correct that. And obviously, it varies. There are people who have it who have it down after just a couple tries, and there are people who spend an entire year doing it and still have no idea what they're doing. But I'd say just a couple days is usually is usually good for most people to become competent. I got a quick question for you. Here in Minnesota, we've got just a ton of different fishing shows on Saturday morning, fishing mm -hmm. with Al Lindner and stuff like that. And they have a lot of tournaments where they go out there for six hours and see who can get the biggest walleye or you know the most sunfish bass fishing bass fishing. Do you guys have tournaments for fly fishing? Uh, there are some. Um, there's, I mean, there are tournaments that allow all kinds of fishing, and some people opt to fly fish. There's also the like national competitions. Like, there's a U.S. fly fishing team, and there's a bunch of European fly fishing teams that usually do pretty well. Uh, that's not really a world I follow too much. It seems to be kind of a different group. Like most people who fish recreationally don't want too much to do with the kind of the competition world, and vice versa. So I know it exists, but I can't really tell you much about it beyond the fact that there there are competitions, but it's, it seems to be more of an organized thing. I'm sure there are like little local tournaments here and there. Like I said, I've never done one, but there is like more of an organized national uh, like competition fly fishing scene. See, I feel like that around Minnesota, the big derbies that they have, we have no regulations on how you catch your fish. So as long as you bring the fish in, it's of certain size and it's a release basis, you're good. So if you go out to, and you're not doing something illegal, mind you, dynamite, like, like dynamite, don't right? use dynamite. I don't think they're going to care. So, you know, it's like going to a rib competition and then bringing beef rib. You know, everybody else is doing pork. You're bringing beef. See what happens. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think most people would probably opt. Like if you're actually trying to win, I think a lot of people would argue that fly fishing would not be the best way to do that. There are definitely situations where a, a fly fisherman can outfish a spin fisherman. Uh, I think in general, though, it's the other way around. Usually, uh, spin fishermen will outfish fly fishermen if it just comes down to number of fish uh, in like a certain amount of time. Now, quick question for you: What is your what is your dream place to go fishing? I mean, I always watch these guys fishing in Alaska where there's bears looking at them. Have you ever ever wanted to go to Alaska fishing, or what's what's your dream vacation to go fishing? Where where would you want to go? 
Yeah, Alaska is definitely on my bucket list. And that's, I mean, primarily because it's, you can do it as, like, I actually just recorded one of my own episodes about this, but you can do it as a DIY destination. So it feels a little bit more exotic. You know, you're getting out away from, you know, the, the lower 48, the stuff that you're used to. And it feels like you're going on this major trip, but you can still do it, you know, without, without a ton of extra planning and cost. You know, you can rent your own, like, flight out in a bush plane if you need to. Uh, you don't necessarily need to have a guide or anything, but uh, so that's definitely on my list just because it seems a little more doable. Uh, but if I could choose one place, I think I'd do Russia. Um, Ooh. I, I, that's, yeah, that's probably my top I'd say. Well, I mean, Russia, they, Why Russia, Russia has a lot of similar, uh, you know, fish and uh, ecology to some of our lakes and streams here, but they just never get touched. Especially yeah, it's just because like because super it's, wild. Yeah. Communistic area doesn't allow a lot of travelers to come in certain areas. Like they had a documentary. What was that place that they uh, did all the manufacturing for all the nuclear plants and, and weapons? I can't remember the city, but they finally opened it up to a few tourists now. And they had like secret fishing locations that no one's ever touched before. And it was just if you're talking about Kamchatka, I think that one just that's that's where I'm talking about. And that I think just opened up to the public. Yes. Maybe 10 years ago or so. It, it, yeah, it's within the last decade. And it's only been still touched by only a, a small few because it costs so much to get out there. And there's t- tons of paperwork. And I mean, who wants to go to a you know nuclear? Yeah, it's, I, it's not Chernobyl, but it's still a risk. I mean, I, I just watched the thing with uh, River Monsters guy, Jeremy, and they went out fishing near the Chernobyl plant right at it actually. And they had to wear the old Geiger counter clicker thingy on their body because there's still so much radiation out there. And I'm thinking, I don't like fishing that much. And yeah, they were catching like their version of walleyes and it was just, they were all record size. Everyone he'd pull up cause it was just untouched. Yeah, that was pretty interesting. And then they showed the city actually that, you know, everybody evacuated out of there and stuff is still sitting there like it was from you know 30 years ago. See, yeah, think, it's always so creepy when you see those like nuclear zones that everyone just fled. It wasn't something like they had time to pack. They were out of there in hours. So it's really creepy to watch that. I think one place I want to see someone fly fish, and Katie, you have to live this dream for us, is right. someone needs to go down to the Amazon, you know, deep, like where you see like Arapaima and all kinds of craziness. Someone needs to fly fish this. <laughs> Oh, that's a thing already. I think you could just you can Google that. There's 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 movies on that now. <laughs> Is there? I've never seen people yep. fly fish. I've seen people do other fishing. I just there's so what many the hell species. Are you fly fish in the Amazon. Well, wouldn't you? They've done Arapaima down there. Oh yeah, oh. They're, they're surface they're surface uh, attackers. That's how, how Jeremy big, got his was like a bait spin on just the surface. It was tiny little bait. And those things are huge. Yeah, this was like eleven feet huge. long. Oh lord! I think Jeremy tried to fly fish for them, didn't he? And then it didn't work, so he he switched out. But I think someone else now has gone down and caught one on the fly. I think it would just be easier to put a small baby calf on the rope and just <laughs> drag it through there. But small baby, <laughs> not a baby. <laughs> gotta gotta chum them up. That's yeah, what you need to do. Go. How come you would would? How is a salmon fly fishing different than you know regular? Have you ever went salmon fly fishing? Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't gone salmon fishing. Um, I think it, it, it's a little bit different, but I like. Like I said, I'm not. I'm not the person to speak to that because I haven't salmon fished before. Okay, I was just wondering if you ever thought of going to England to try those salmon to see if the uh, like off the book. This fit. This lure. In this color catches this fit. You know. Yeah, I don't think that's up my alley. I mean, I wouldn't turn it down if someone wanted to send me over there to fish, but. Like Western Europe isn't isn't super high on my list of places to go fish, but I know a lot of people get really into that going to this specific river and and doing the traditional like dressing the traditional way and using the traditional flies and all that. I don't think it'd be more fun to go salmon fish in Alaska and and trying to beat the bear off with a stick when you're pulling your salmon in. I think it'd just be more fun. Yeah, and you can bring it home and eat it. The the bear. Wow. Yeah. I know the salmon. You're a mean woman. But the ba- the bear too, if you if you get it. <laughs> <laughs> be a great YouTube video. Yeah, it would be, yeah. So I'm gonna do last three questions for would the sake of time. Would that be surf and turf? Surf. <laughs> <laughs> oh hey, boy. we have a new idea for your only for, if you're wearing a wife beater. Yeah. That's how it works. For your next podcast, Katie, we got you know, we're, we're gonna throw you some money. We're gonna get you like twelve dollars in gas, get out of town and go up to Alaska <laughs> fishing. And we'll get you a big stick, and then if you bring back a bear, we'll help you mount it. All right. I'll need that big stick provided, because I'm sure I won't be able to find any up there. <laughs> the bears. <laughs> the bears. So, last three questions for the sake of time. And again, thanks for coming on the podcast with us. Any secret fish recipes that you have? Ooh. Um, I don't I don't have a ton of, like, complicated recipes. I, I like simple things. Um, but my, I'd say my most commonly 
use style of cooking fish is I just take the, like if we're talking trout here, take the entire trout, um, wipe off the slime, cut off the head, gut it, give it a couple slices down the side, each side. And then I just stuff a couple like lemon wedges inside with some butter, salt and pepper, um, whatever other spices you want on your fish. And then I just wrap it up in tin foil. And I'm usually, I, I think I most often eat fish when I'm camping. So we usually just throw those foil packs in the fire, but you could also throw them on the grill. Uh, and then we just pull them out and the flesh will just kind of fall right off the bone. So we just kind of eat the whole fish as like finger food, assuming I mean, most of the fish we eat are probably between 10 and 12 inches. So I'm not like filleting them. I'll fillet them if they're a lot bigger, but for the size we usually keep, we'll just like pick it right off the bone and then you'll just be left with like a perfect little fish skeleton when you're done. Just like the cartoons. Just like the cartoons, but there's no head because you cut it off. Oh. So just just the spine and the ribs and the tail. <laughs> Next question is Jimmy's most important question. What's that? How do you select a good beer for your trip? Oh, probably the most oh, important I, thing. I just wrote an article about how to do this, so I'm well well versed in it. I take a whole bunch of things into account, but as much as I love craft beer, I did recommend some craft beers in the article I wrote, but my number one fishing beer is still Coors Light because it is cheap and I don't mind when I spill an entire can of it into the river and it stays cool and refreshing on a hot day. But if I'm choosing a craft beer, I'll kind of do the same thing. I want it to be relatively cheap, so I'm not upset if I spill it. Uh, I want it to be light and refreshing, so I'm saving things like IPAs or stouts for when I get home. And I'm usually taking something like a lager or pilsner, something like that, or even like a sour, something refreshing. And then if you really want to go into the weeds, there are a couple breweries that prioritize things like donating to your local waters. So I know Upslope does that. They're they're partnered with Trout Unlimited. So I think they either work with them somehow or donate some money. So if you if you really want to get into the weeds, there are some breweries that you can support that will give back to the resource as well. And soon to sponsor your podcast, hopefully, if they're listening. Hopefully, to yeah. <laughs> give Katie a call. I want to adopt Katie. <laughs> Everything in time. I do. <laughs> okay, Grandpa Jimmy. Yes, right. I don't drink beer. I Contrary to popular opinion, they don't believe that I'm not half drunk at every podcast. But if I was to pick it, I would pick Coors as well, just because I have made bottle cap fishing lures for many, many years, and there's nothing better than Coors to catch fish with. Really? So for those that are listening that want to, uh, this is another sad hear Rob's story. design. This yeah, is not a sad is. story. This oh, is, here's another sad, sad this story. This is how sad young Rob's made money in Minnesota. You take a bottle cap. Now, this is Rob's patented design, right? I'm giving. Where'd you get the bottle cap? I thought you were using cans. Oh no, no, no! This is this. You have to do b- bottles. For See, this. that's why I'm in his life. I drink the beer. I, I pay for the beer. I supply the bottle cap. Cause right? Because Rob doesn't I drink. See. Well, I was young. I had to go up to the local bar and ask them for their bottle caps, and they just give me bags of whatever they had because they throw them out. So I get all these, and I have to sort them out first. So you sort out all the flavors, and then you take your bottle cap, you bend it. Um, kind of in half. It kind of like to bend it into a spoon shape, right? You drill two holes at the top tips, and you put uh, the uh, spinner. Uh, it's kind of like a keychain loop, but tiny ones for your lure. <laughs> Why are you looking at me? Like I, I'm trying to get like it. a name. I know <laughs> you're looking at me like I'm going to help you out with. I'm this. like thinking the parts at Walmart and ordering them on Amazon. I have no idea what they're called. Oh lord! But you put like a little spinner job. It's like a little key ring loop at, at both ends, and you put a treble hook on it. That is literally making a like a spoon for pike fishing. It's wonderful. It wobbles in the water when you're reeling it in, kind of making that reflective, shiny velour. And you, I catch you know, musky pike, uh, bass, any any smaller mouth, uh, large mouth bass on those, and it worked really well. I sold them for like buck fifty a piece growing up. I put them on mason jars and drop them off at bars. That's how I made my scratch back when I was a kid. I would give you dollar fifty just to get off my porch and quit selling me this crap. Come on, Jimmy, will you buy my cookies? No, I'm not buying your cookies. Get off my porch. So, it, give it a try. I can even I can see if I can find a picture. I think I might have a couple around. I made some of this last year. Nobody cares to show a picture. No, seriously, nobody cares. Well, thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. What's the last question you got for Katie? Last question and most important question: If they want to come, you know, listen into your podcast, see some of your content, I see that you have a blog. Where's the best place to go? Yeah, so that just lives all on fishuntamed.com. So that's the blog. It's got the podcast. Um, There's a player on there that you can listen to all the episodes. And then really, I'm just on Instagram is the only social media I'm on. And that's also under Fish Untamed. So that's if you you just type in those words, you'll you'll end up at the right spot somewhere. We need to get on Instagram because I went on Katie's Instagram earlier and it looks so fun. It looks like a travel guide. 
it literally looks like it's just all these sweet fishing places. So if you want to get inspired, the Instagram is the best place to go, in my opinion. Well, thanks again, Katie. I really appreciate it. Hopefully, people won't uh, just try to go through their uh, grandma and grandpa's uh, fly kits to steal rustic feathers that they're going to sell on eBay. And instead, give fly fishing a, a real try. I appreciate you on the podcast. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. I had a great time. You guys got anything else? I'm good. Adam's good? I can't believe Adam's good. Adam's normally great, so we'll, we'll work on it. <laughs> but thanks again, guys. Podcast out. Thanks, guys, for listening to this podcast. Please visit us at AquariumGuysPodcast.com and listen to us on Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes, and anywhere you can listen to podcasts. We're practically everywhere. We're on Google. I mean, just go to your favorite place, Pocket Casts. Subscribe to make sure it gets push notifications directly to your phone. Otherwise, Jim will be crying in his sleep. Can, can I listen to it in the in my treehouse? In your treehouse, in your fish room, even alone at work. What about at my man cave? Especially your man cave. Yeah. Only if Adam's there. No. With feeder guppies. No. no. They're endless. You midget loving quack <laughs> sucking motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we'll see you next time. <laughs> Later.